Jesus Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If anyone present knows any reason why Jane and John should not be married, you must now declare it or forever hold your peace. That familiar part of many traditional wedding ceremonies is, I must admit, one of my favorites. Partly because I imagine that when I say that, or somebody says that at a wedding I'm attending, suddenly someone's going to charge through the church doors on horseback and jump down and say, Jane, you cannot marry that man, for you are my true love. It appeals both to our sense of romanticism and to our, our sense of the dramatic. For that reason, I was counseled in seminary that one should always give a nice long pause for that so that the drama can build up, only to be relieved when the pastor continues with the ceremony. Some say it adds gravitas. It lands the seriousness and eternal quality of the commitment being made by the couple. But the truth is, I think the reason that I probably like it, and most people probably like it, is because I'm titillated by the possibility of catastrophe. <laughs> But really, this is just a performance. It's pro forma. We all know that the couple is going to be married, that no one's going to raise an objection. Uh, we have a legal wedding license. We've done counseling with these people. We, we know that no objection is really going to be raised. It's an unnecessary flourish. The temptation of Jesus is similarly pro forma, both for us reading it now and for the communities that read it originally. No one who has ever read this test this text of this test have ever taken the temptation seriously in the sense that they think that this time when they read the story, Jesus is actually going to fall for it. No, we know the conclusion ahead of time. It's not really a temptation at all. Nor is this really an allegory of Christian moral uprightness, as though an imitation of Christ resisting temptation, we somehow become like him and resisting the devil. For one thing, the text, if you read it, uh, these temptations have nothing to do with the kind of temptations that you or I face. At least not in the sense that what we face in temptation is anything like the level of what Jesus is dealing with. No, this is a text about Jesus and about his place in the world and his relationship with God. And it resists to be anything else. This is about Christian cosmology. And the central assertion is that there is no equivalency between Jesus and the devil. This is not an equal fight. There are not two foes that are contending on a battlefield. It's a false equivalency. Good and evil are not equally powerful. Jesus and Satan are not contending on earth with each other, locked in some kind of death grip like Gandalf the Grey and Balrog tumbling through uh, the earth in the Lord of the Rings series, or like Sherlock and Moriarty falling at the falls. Um, Jesus, unlike those figures, refuses to throw himself down to wrestle with any demon from any height. But our desire to make it so, to try to pretend like there is an equivalency between the devil and Christ in this world, reveals the seductive character of that narrative. We like Gnosticism. If you're not familiar with it, Gnosticism is kind of a general term, but it refers to a cluster of beliefs that were prevalent in the ancient world and continue to reemerge in history. It basically asserts that the world is a kind of evil place and that there's really no moral good or evil. It's a balanced world and that to escape from that cycle of morality, you need special knowledge. It believes in individual exceptionalism, that if you're just smart enough, if you know the right secret or the right ritual to perform, you too can escape moral consequence. And remove yourself from the community of people and kind of rise to a higher level and become enlightened and so on. You see a bit of this, by the way, in serial killer shows, which are very popular right now. Shows like Hannibal, The Fall, which is one of my favorites on BBC. I love it. It's also kind of maddening, but I love it. Uh, or uh, True Detective, which uh, has its season uh, conclusion today. Um, serial killers like that, uh, shows like that, show something very interesting about our society. For one thing, we want our killers to be demonic and powerful and even admirable. Uh, you notice in all these shows, the criminals involved are masterminds. You know, they, they are geniuses at doing evil. They, they're very clever people. And uh, in order to catch them, you need an equally intelligent and exceptional detective. You notice that these shows, there's always like this special detective or maybe two that work together in a partnership perhaps. But they're always much, much smarter than every other cop. Right? And because of that, they're allowed to do morally problematic things. There's a kind of moral exceptionalism that goes along with, with that. Of course, the truth of any, of any investigation that you might have ever looked into is that it's a whole team of people that catches these folks. And the truth is that serial killers in real life are, are no more uh, smart or stupid than any of the rest of us. They're just pathological or sociological. There's something in these shows that makes an interesting reference often to Nietzsche. 
Uh, Nietzsche was a German philosopher who had this philosophy, the Ubermensch, the ultimate man. And part of that philosophy was that, uh, again, goes back to individual exceptionalism, this notion that if you were kind of in on the secret of the universe, if you're clued in, then the rules of right and wrong no longer apply to you. But again, this notion of the Ubermensch is challenged by the banality of real evil. I've only really met, as far as I know, I don't know about you guys, but I've only met one real murderer in my life. It was when I was a hospital chaplain, and uh, this man had killed his wife in front of some witnesses and stabbed another man, and then he ran off and tried to commit suicide. He botched the job, and the uh, police were able to uh, find him and bring him to the hospital, and he was in a coma for a few months. His family argued that he should be removed from life support because, I mean, what kind of quality of life would he have or something along those lines. And the hospital did seriously consider removing life support before he started to show signs of recovery. The first thing that he communicated when he emerged from his coma was he, he signaled for something to write on because he was still intubated, and he wrote, I want my lawyer. <laughs> he was perfectly aware of, of what he had done. But of course, when I or any other man tried to talk to him, he would uh, pretend like he didn't understand what was happening to him, that he was confused, he didn't know what had happened, and he was just, just really upset because he was confused, right? But as soon as the men left the room, he would start telling the nurses and other women that might be around the details of his deed. I mean, this is the stupidity of evil that he didn't realize that, of course, the nurses were going to tell the cops. Of course, they were going to tell the rest of us in staff meetings exactly what he was saying. And in fact, this would probably be used later against him in court. Also, this didn't really serve as self-interest. For one thing, it made the nurses hate the guy, and all of us hated him. And we were quite happy to transfer him to a prison hospital as soon as he was well enough to go. But speak of the banality of evil, I ran into his family on the elevator one day. And his brother told me about how he could, couldn't help himself, he had to say, you know why he did it, don't you? And he told me about how this man had had an affair with this woman that he had stabbed. And I mean, as a chaplain, you're not really trained to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> so I said, oh, <laughs> what, what do you say in the elevator to a revelation like that? Interestingly, behind my back shortly after that, the family requested that I no longer be allowed to see this guy. Because you see, in that kind of moral constellation of, of cops and lawyers and family members, my place was quite dangerous. Like, you know, who knows what might happen if the guy actually confessed or, you know, who knows, right? So they got rid of me and I was quite happy to, to leave, let me tell you. So my experience of true evil, meeting somebody like that, was that he was weak, he was a bully, he was not particularly smart, he was not certainly an ubermensch. You see, there is a falseness to this narrative of good and evil being equally balanced in the world. And Christ exposes that falseness of that worldview in stories such as this one. The story of the temptation reveals something true and eternal about the world, that there is no equivalency between God and the devil. In Christ, we are free because ultimately, we see in this that there is only light. There is no contest. And in realizing that, we experience the freedom that Christ offers us. I'm going to open this up as I customarily do and uh, see if anybody has any responses.